Well, we are studying Revelation and chapter 13. I'll tell you, the world is looking for a leader. I'll tell you, America is looking for a leader. I think it's been a while since we have had a leader that a lot of America follows. Might, might have to go all the way back to Reagan, who had landslide victories, to even see that. Seems like every election from George Bush on is just contested, 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 and no one seems happy. Probably because our leaders might be looked upon as self uh, selfish. They're just doing everything out of selfish ambition as opposed to some of our founding fathers who didn't even want to be president. George Washington, right? <laughs> he didn't even want to be president and yet they begged him until he finally accepted because they needed a good leader. Much less America, this whole world is really looking for a world leader to unify and to um, bring peace, bring joy, bring happiness. Those are all the things that they're looking for. But I'm going to tell you, there is a man coming who will be the world leader that the world is looking for. And his name is Satan. It's going to happen. And the world's going to get exactly what it's asking for. Kind of like the Israelites, when they asked for a king instead of the system they had, God finally gave in and they got what they were asking for. And it turned out no good. Only one or two or maybe three or four of the kings were worth anything. The rest of them all led Israel into sin and they were all selfish. Thinking about themselves only. Well, that's what the world leader in the future still is going to be. Satan, he is going to rule. He is going to be a world leader. People are going to follow him. People are going to be amazed by him. And for certain people, for a certain length of time, they're going to be extremely happy. But then everything's going to fall apart. And it really happens pretty fast, I think. He will bring peace. He will bring prosperity. He will be Satan. For three and a half years, he takes over the world. And then... During that three and a half years, when he really takes over the world, it is going to be chaos and hardship. God's anger is being poured out. His wrath is being poured out on this earth. At the same time, Satan and his wrath, his anger, with all of his demons, though even the ones that are chained right now, is going to be poured out on this earth. Bad times. No one should be looking forward to it. The effort that Satan will be using all of his energy forward to is the elimination of the Israelites. He will want to destroy the Jews and he will want to prevent Christ's second coming. He will do everything he can to stop that. The effort is a massacre beyond anything we have ever seen. The Holocaust is nothing. Now, we experienced a worldwide flood before any of us were here. That got rid of a lot of people. This is going to be the same type of killing, but it's going to be different. It's going to be over seven years instead of really one day everybody died in that flood. It's going to be bad. In chapter 13 and verse number 1 of Revelation, it says, And I stood upon the, the sea, 
the, the sand of the sea. Your Bible might say, and he stood upon the sand of the sea. It's probably the better translation. So it's not talking about John standing on the sea. It's talking about this dragon. And in verse 17, we find out he's wroth with the woman. And now all of a sudden, the beast is standing on the sea. And he saw this beast rise up out of the sea. So you have the dragon who's standing on the sand of the sea. And then this beast rises up out of it. Who is that? Well, in, in chapter 12, the dragon obviously is Satan. So Satan's standing on the sea, he has his, or on the sands of the sea, he has his feet firmly planted in that earth there. And that is him standing on this earth. That's what it's indicating. He's amongst the people, the sands of the sea that's talking about the people on this earth. And out then he sees out of the sea coming this beast that is the antichrist this child of satan and this beast he is a man he's going to rule over the world kingdoms he's going to be empowered by satan and that's why when i said satan's going to have his way satan's going to rule he's going to do it through this beast that comes out of the sea, which is the Antichrist. He has ten horns, seven heads. The horns represent power. Always does in the animal kingdom. It's power. It's a symbol of strength. And it's and the horns represent kings. Ten represents all of the world of human power that is going to assist him so there's going to be these 10 kings if you will some people think it's going to be 10 kingdoms that all come together and form this one union and, that, and that's possible but I, and I think in the end when you look at this and when you talk about the power and everything that they're going through i believe it's representing just all the kingdoms of the world of the time now maybe the world is just divided basically up into 10 basic kingdoms at that time and they all come together and they get this one united kingdom going forward in daniel chapter 7 we see this beast with 10 horns and and, and this one disrupts three of the 10 horns so it's as if he comes up right out of the middle of all those kingdoms and he uproots a couple of them so it's almost like he destroys some nations on his rising up that's this antichrist as he comes up he's not going to worry about anybody else but himself and if he uproots some of the horns in his ways to the power to get there it's what happens he's a little horn at first so he's not very well known at first he's not uh and if antichrist is here on this earth right now we would not know it because he's just a little horn he might just be some little half-known guy over in Europe somewhere. But he's not a world power. And that's why when people, they, they kept attributing, you know, like uh, back when I was grow, growing off, it was, what was it, what was his name? The guy that had Florida on his forehead from Russia. <laughs> What's his name? Putin. Not Putin. Gorbachev. Gorbachev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gorbachev, yeah. People are saying, oh, he's got to be antichrist for whatever reasons and he was too well known as far as i was concerned he's a little horn he's not russia <laughs> he might be somewhat known but not like our other world leaders and he comes up and he disrupts three of the horns and as he comes up he speaks out against the most high if you remember that he says you know the god of heaven is not really god you guys should be worshiping me. You should be worshiping other things. I also believe that what we're going to see here is that it is basically going to be the revived Roman Empire. Comes back into being. 
if you can remember back in those days, what was ruling everything? The Roman Empire. I mean, the Roman Empire, you know, right now when you think of Rome, what do you think of? Uh, you know, that little town in Italy, right? <laughs> but the Romans, they owned everything back then. The known world, basically, was run by the Romans. And I believe that whoever this little horn is, he might be a pope. Very well think it could be a pope that rises to this power and he unites everybody behind him through the power of Satan. And his kingdom goes from Italy all over the whole world, encompasses the known world of today, not just the known world of then. Satan, by the way, I think still has tremendous impact on our churches today. He still wants all the religions to band together. I think he's preparing for the tribulation period always. I think the ecumenical movement that started was something that Satan was involved with heavily, or heavily because if the rapture were to occur, ecumenical movement was already here. They could have all banded together and been involved with their one world religion and their one world government. But that's how things are going to go. Verse number two. So we talked about his um, ancestry. Let's talk about his authority. Verse number two. And the beast, oh, and by the way, in, in verse number one, it says, upon his horns had ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Remember me say that he's going to speak out of it against God, he's going to speak out against Christ all the time. He is going to blaspheme God over and over and over again. That is what he is. He's a blasphemous person. So verse number two, his authority. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power and his seat and great authority. So this is quite a interesting sight coming up out of the sea, isn't it? I've seen people try to draw what this looks like. <laughs> it looks pretty ridiculous, okay? <laughs> if you can put that in your in your head, he looks like a leopard, but he's got the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, and some kind of power from Satan. This reminds me, though, as I read it, of imagery that we have from the book of Daniel. Turn with me, if you will, back to Daniel in chapter 7, because this is going to describe, if you will, some interesting things for us. Daniel chapter 7. Ezekiel is longer than I want it to be, always. Daniel in chapter 7. I always think of it as just being like, you know, 20 chapters, and then you're up there in the 40s, and you're like, when is this book ending? Daniel <laughs> chapter 7, and go down to verse number 3. It's going to sound familiar. And four great beasts came up from the sea, Diverse, one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it and they said thus unto it arise devour much flesh after this i beheld and lo another like a leopard which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl the beast had also four heads and dominion was given to it after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, 
dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Boy, you can see a lot of the same imagery here, can't you? Same animals. But then there's another one that comes up later that has all this iron in him, in it. Well, this is representative of four world empires. The lion, the Babylonian kingdom, fierce, consuming power. The bear is the Medo-Persian kingdom, ferocious strength, mighty stability. Leopards have great stability. I mean, bears do. Leopard is Greece. It moves swiftly and rapidly across the earth. That's Alexander the Great, by the way. We know who he is. There was a fourth indescribable one. He's terrifying. He's strong. Has large iron teeth. Devoured and crushed and trampled the remainder with its feet. It is the one that had the ten horns. This is Rome. Absolutely. Roman Empire. And, and we see that type of imagery all through the Bible when we look at the um, statue, the head of gold, chest of silver, bronze, and then iron. Same empires described there. Same things that are going on. Same things that are listed. The beast that is coming out of the water embodies all of those animals. So think of the Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persian Empire, the Greece Empire, what they did, the Roman Empire, and what they did. This beast that's coming out of the ocean, guess what? He embodies them all. You think those empires were powerful? He's all of them wrapped up into one. This is describing power beyond anything we have ever seen on the face of this earth. Remember at one point in time, there was a saying that said the sun never sets on the English Empire or the... Well, the Roman Empire, but also the England Empire, right? Didn't they have places all over the world? I'm sure they did, Yeah. I'm sure they did too, especially when they owned America, right? Nothing compared to what this beast is going to be. By the way, this beast had the ten horns. Did you see the Roman Empire there? Ten horns, right? Fierceness of Medo-Persian Empire. Swiftness of the Greeks. Strength of Babylonian, of the Babylon, Babylonian Empire. And they make this indescribable beast that comes up out of the water. And what does it say about him? We're back into Revelation in chapter 13 then. The dragon gives the beast power, doesn't he? How does the beast get all of his power? He's going to be a man, but he's going to get his power from the beast. The Antichrist has great power. He has sheer force. He can't be halted. And the end of verse number 13, or at the verse, end of verse number 2, it says, and his seat, in other words, the, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Satan gives him his throne. Gives him the power to do it. Gives him tremendous authority. The right to act. The freedom to act. It basically means there's no accountability whatsoever. He can go off and do whatever he wants. Why? There's no restraint from God at this time. The demons can go act and do whatever they want to do. God isn't standing up there saying, no, don't do that to this guy. No, don't do that to this guy. No, no, no. If God is going to protect anybody, it's simply going to be the Israelites 
the ones that he sealed. And he's going to protect some of the believers of the time, isn't he? Other than that, Satan's going to have his way. He's going to get to do whatever he wants to on this earth. There's no holding back anymore. He doesn't have to ask God's permission anymore as he does at this day and time. So verse number three, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Now, how will he become like a God to this world? I think this verse starts to explain to us why people follow him so closely. One of his heads were wounded to death. It literally means something died. It was slain. It's the same word that's used back in chapter 5 and verse number 6 when John saw a lamb standing as if slain. It was killed. The false antichrist, the false messiah of that time, if you will, is going to go through some of the same things that Christ himself actually did. He's going to present himself as having been killed. Now, I don't personally think that there's going to be a resurrection at that time. It could happen. But he's going to be looked at by the world that he dies. Some people will want to say, well, they believe it's talking about the Roman Empire. They think the Roman Empire is dead. It's gone away. And because he revives the Roman Empire, then the people are going to be in, in awe and wonder at at his ability to bring back the Roman Empire. But I personally think that what happens here when it says that one of his heads were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed, I think he is going to be injured somehow in some kind of fight or some kind of thing that happens. Someone might try to murder him. He's going to appear to the world as having died. I think he's going to present himself that way. And then what's going to happen? And all the world wondered after the beast. They're going to say what? Look, he died and he rose from the dead. He's our Messiah. Let's worship him. Will he literally die? I guess he could. God can work mysterious ways and mysterious wonders, can't he? I don't think he will. I think he's simply... Because it says one of his heads, it's not all of his heads. I think he's going to be injured somehow, some way. Just like Christ's, it says Christ's heel was wounded, right? That's not a crushing death blow. And that's exactly what this guy is going to go through. Wounded. And the people are going to look at him and say, Wow. He's alive. Let's worship him. Or maybe it'll be like as if he's on his deathbed. I don't know. But the whole world is deceived by what happens. And you know what? If you're around during that time and you see someone that looks like they died and rose from the dead and presents himself that way and everybody else believes that it happened, you're probably going to believe the same thing yourself. You don't want to be here during those times. But that's what's going to happen. Now look at verse number four. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Fascination turns into worship. You notice who it says that they worshipped? They worshipped the dragon. Literally, Satan worship. Do you know who people are worshiping when they worship in their own false religions? Same thing. They're worshiping the dragon disguised as Buddha or anything else. Satan is involved with it. It's all Satan worship. Humanism is Satan worship when you get down to it. Man is worshiping himself, but he's exalted in Satan. People are going to be fascinated with what happens. And it's not hard to imagine that this could happen. Do our world leaders today 
get worshipped. I think they, they do. Maybe not as like they're a god, but they present themselves in some tremendous ways. And let, and let me tell you what, some of the things that I see people doing with leaders today is kind of crazy. Now, we've seen what Hitler did, right? He set himself up and people almost worshipped him. But I'll tell you what, there is a faction of people that almost seem like they worship Donald Trump. I don't want to say it that way, but it's it's as if he can't do any wrong and they almost worship him. There's some kind of strange fascination about a man. And he he won't go away. I mean, he is around. <laughs> and his followers are around. And he has the ability to work people up into a frenzy. And it's on both sides of the aisle. If you hate him, he'll work you up into a frenzy. And if you love him, he'll work you up into a frenzy. So it's not a surprise that some world leader can come along and have everybody love him because they think he died and rose from the dead. And then whatever he has to say, everybody's going to follow and believe like it's the gospel. Like he can't do any wrong. And that's what this leader is going to be like. Way more powerful than Donald Trump, by the way. The whole world is going to follow him. Look at what it says here. And they worshipped the beast. So they worshipped the dragon. They worshipped the beast, which is the man. He is the one that is filled with Satan. Saying, who is like unto the beast? What are they going to say? Wow, he's amazing. Who is like him? He is Messiah. He is who we're looking for. He maybe can stop all this craziness happening on this earth at this time. Who is able to make war with him? That's his power. And in the end, when you don't have any believers on this earth, or very few, and the people that are here are worshiping, so the ones that aren't Christians are worshiping him, what are they saying? We just want to be with the guy that has all the power. Who can make war with him? He wins every time. And that's what happens no matter where you are in the world. If you can feel safe behind some kind of government, those people will jump in on that side. And they will switch sides fast, by the way. They'll move from being a Democrat society to being a... Uh, underneath the power of some kind of crazy world leader because they feel like they're going to gain power from it. And that's this world leader, empowered by Satan. As he stands on the seashores, it's in this world, and this beast comes up out of the sea, and he empowers it with no other desire except to take Christ off the throne, ruin Christ's upcoming kingdom, try to stop the second coming and try to get rid of any believer on this earth, but especially the Jew. If he can stop any of those things, then he's won the victory. Because what is Christ looking for? This millennial kingdom, the time, his, the, 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 the kingdom that uh, goes on for eternity, a heaven. If Satan can stop all of that, now he's God. But you know what? He can't do it. He won't do it. He'll still try. He, he will try, and then he'll try, and then he'll try again, and he'll fail every single time. He has so far. He will continue to be. He's crazy, but in the end, he is so hateful that he'll try until he has his last chance. And he doesn't care. He is after and seeking to devour anybody that he can. All right, let's have a word of prayer. And next week, we'll talk about Christmas things instead of the beast.
Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for this study. I pray, Lord, that as we take a look, and we did, we took a look at Daniel chapter 7, and it, it, what a great prophecy there to show what uh, the, the world was going to go through back then, 3,000 years ago, and then also what's going to happen in our future. This beast comes up out of the sea, unifies this world, going to be a great leader, powered by the dragon, Satan himself. I pray, Lord, that as we look at these future events, that we'll be able to see what the millennial kingdom is going to look like and see how Satan is trying to stop it all, but Christ is still going to come and have his way and rule and reign. And us today, we're going to be up in heaven, looking down, seeing all this, and then coming and ruling and reigning with him. What a tremendous uh, pieces of prophecy we have to think about our future. Father, now we just ask your blessings as we go off into our world this week. Uh, Christmas season is upon us, and so we pray that we can remember Christ that is with us and that we would see the manger scenes, that we would see uh, this Christmas season and not think about Santa Claus, but think about Christ. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, we do have a closing song.